Hello, everyone. If I can have your attention, please. I know that you're right in the middle of eating, and it's, it's, it is a little bit awkward. But I've been asked uh, to undertake a very pleasant task, and one that uh, came to me unexpectedly just a minute ago, but which is going to give me a great opportunity. And that task is to introduce um, Tim Cook, uh, who needs no introduction, so my task is made that much easier thereby. Um, Tim is, going to, is having a book lunch, and I know that uh, some of you are perfectly aware that uh, there are boxes of books back there uh, with his name on it, um, most particularly the Vimy book, about which more in just one second. I wanted to introduce Tim to you perhaps in a way that um, some of you don't know him. You know him through his writings, perhaps, if you don't know him personally. Um, and you've uh, come to note him as uh, Canada's premier um, historian of the First World War. Um, of, of late and in recent years and for a long-lasting time, I, I suspect. And that Tim's books, as you know, on the First World War and the Second World War um, have collectively won quite a few prizes, including some of the most prestigious prizes in this country. Tim is an internationally known scholar. Not only has he written, is it eight or nine now, Tim, books? Ten. It's not eight or nine, it's ten. Um, <laughs> And he's the author of probably 100 uh, articles, uh, most of them scholarly and many of them professional but terrific. Um, and he has become one of our um, most um, cherished historical resources in this country. And everybody at this conference has already had the opportunity of benefiting from his astute knowledge. Uh, but not only that, um, from his um, generous spirit in helping and giving anybody advice, help, um, the answers have arrived when Tim walks in the door. Um, and I think that um, that is one of his greatest qualities, is his willingness to transfer to others his wealth of knowledge and experience. Uh, he's a mentor to, uh, at his young age, he's already been a mentor for a long time and continues to mentor others as well. Um, his latest book, of course, uh, the timely um, appearance of Vimy, um, is it the myth and the battle? The is battle it? and the legend. It's the battle and the legend. So you can tell I just got asked to do this, yes. The battle, the battle and the legend um, is um, not surprisingly at all uh, the number one bestseller in Canada, uh, will remain the number one bestseller in Canada for the foreseeable future, uh, and it alone has the opportunity to do so many of the things that we have discussed at this conference that uh, many Canadians and Canadian institutions, including perhaps educational institutions, have failed to do. Set the record straight and enable a new generation of Canadians to learn about Vimy, the battle, the site, the memorial, the myth, and the enduring legacy. And so I think that Tim Cook is uh, to be applauded, not only for this book, but for uh, uh, two decades of publishing and giving to Canadians the history that so many of them have forgotten. So I feel that I've gone on long enough and that I'm not the main event. The main event, of course, is Tim Cook, and I give him to you now. Thank you. Uh, Serge and I go way back, and it's... Uh, I, I quite literally asked him to introduce me 32 seconds ago, so uh, I thank him for that. And I did it partially because I respect Serge's scholarship, his expertise, and his uh, vision of history, which he transferred to me uh, when I started at the Canadian War Museum in early 2002. I had really no idea what I was really going to be doing there. They invited me over. This was part of Jack Granistein uh, years before setting up the museum, saying that historians would run this museum. Uh, Roger Sardi, Jack Granistein, uh, uh, Dean Oliver, and, and Serge Durflinger set up the real core of what the new Canadian War Museum is. And I was lucky to come on with Peter McLeod uh, to help round that off. Um, and I spent many, many hours listening to Serge listening to uh, who we should hate together, um, <clears throat> who was on our side, uh, and there were some fierce battles that will be told at some point, and maybe if you buy me a few drinks uh, at some point, over the creation of the Canadian War Museum. Uh, but it, my task was made much easier there by Serge's generosity and friendship and scholarship. 
I'm going to talk just very briefly about my new book, Vimy. Um, this is a signed copy for Pat Brennan, and I want to make sure I give this to you, Pat, before I leave today. It's a book that I have been thinking about for a long time. As a First World War historian in this country, you have to come to grips to some degree with Vimy and what it means, both as a battle and I think as an idea. And that's what the book was. I talked before about this, so I don't want to talk a lot about the book, except that I think it was a challenge to write about a history of an idea. There weren't a lot of other books that explored that in the Canadian context. And how you marshal your evidence, and how you talk about an idea, and how you try to assess the impact of an idea um, are, were some of the most challenging and then ultimately rewarding parts of this book. And I hope if you do have a chance to read it, and of course it is for sale back there, and I encourage that, be happy to sign books after, uh, I hope it will tell us both about the battle, but also about the First World War and its place in Canadian history. And it's a, it's a book that I started to write, and I thought it would really be about the battle with a couple chapters on the memory of it. And it turned out to be something quite different, much more of an attempt to understand the Canadian experience of war over time and how that unfolds and its important place in our society or those times in our history when war or veterans have not been an important part of our society. I'm a hybrid historian of sorts. I have my academic training. I have a PhD in history. I believe it's important to go to conferences to give papers. But I'm also one who is a public historian who works in a public history environment at the Canadian War Museum. And that has influenced how I write history. And I'm very lucky to have run into Jack Granitstein at one point, Canada's most important historian, uh, certainly our most important military historian. And Jack said to me at one point, you need to start writing books that Canadians are going to read. And I had written two books before that, academic books, good books, I think, but had a limited readership. And he and others and my work at the War Museum impressed upon me the importance of sharing our stories, talking about our history. It's a complex history. It's an important history. It defines who we are and who we might be and who we could be in the future. And I think we need to write in a way that takes and accounts for the recent scholarship. You need to do archival research, but you also need to find a way to tell the story in an interesting manner. And I hope that my books have done that over the last 10 or so years. This book and this opportunity to stand up here, I want to take to thank a few people. Because with my books, I send them off to a whole bunch of readers over time. Um, in my books in the past, Serge, Serge Durflinger has read them and commented upon them. He did that for my two World War II histories that came out. He saved me from errors of omission and commission. He is a great friend, and he has gotten me through some tough times as well. Serge didn't read this book, partially because both Serge and I have pretty firm views about Vimy, but I have benefited from his scholarship from our discussions and especially the understanding I think of French Canada and the First World War of which Serge is the premier scholar in our country. I was very lucky to have Pat Brennan um, read this manuscript. Pat is here. Pat is a fantastic scholar. Uh, he and Mark Humphreys who you heard from yesterday as well both read it both offering words of encouragement but also of caution about how we should talk about Canada, how we should talk about the nation or multiple nations, how symbols and signs and these issues uh, play out over time. And so both Pat and Mark, who are here, offer tremendous support. Dr. Bill Stewart, who is here, who is an, an incredibly um, efficient and proficient scholar of tactics and doctrine. Bill read the manuscript and he would give me, and I'm not kidding here, and I know Bill's here somewhere, he would give me three pages or so on the use of the Lewis machine gun. Like, I have kept his notes because they are worthy of publishing someday, Bill. It was great. You had a lot of time on your hands, I think. It was good. 
and I benefited from that, and uh, I enjoy, uh, Bill is in Ottawa, his great book on Sir Richard Turner, and a new book that will be coming out on the Battle of the Somme, which I look forward to. Um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Mike Bechtold, Mike, who has been a friend of mine uh, for over 20 years, longtime editor of Canadian Military History. Mike and I have talked over the years, we have a uh, a great friendship. At the last innings of this book, I said, Mike, I need some images. And he said, well, if you see Mike, he's always got a camera. Uh, he sent me some, and I appreciate that, as well as uh, talking about Vimy over the years. And finally, I mean, there's six or seven other scholars who read this book and commented upon it. I want to uh, especially thank Dr. Jack Granistein. Um Jack has been a supporter of mine over the years. He has read every book of mine, I think, um, from start to finish. And I sent him, I remember one example of Jack. Jack is famous for both writing books faster than we can read them um, and commenting on every manuscript that's out there. And I sent him my book, Cleo's Warriors. I said, Jack, you don't really know me, but I would love to hear your input uh, on this. It's on the writing of Canadian military history. And uh, he sent me an email, this was back in 2006, I suppose. He said, yeah, uh, receive the manuscript. I go, okay, that's great. And then by the end of the day, he sent me an email said, returning the manuscript to you. And I went, okay, that, that was a waste of postage, I guess. But, and of course, it came two days later, and it's all marked up. And the famous Jackisms like, uh, bullshit, uh, <coughs> you know, maybe, seems unlikely. Uh, but I have benefited from his scholarship, as everybody in Canada has, as many in this room have. And it is a great pleasure to, uh, to just uh, announce again that Jack and I will be doing an exhibition at the Canadian War Museum next year on the 100 Days campaign based upon his very fine book. And I hope you will visit us there. I'm just going to wrap up here and just say that this is a book I hope that is important to you those who study history, those who care about history, to try to explore and untangle the idea of Vimy, a complex idea that has mattered to us as Canadians over multiple generations. It was a book that I wrote because I felt it was important to write. It is also a, bo a book I wrote that I wasn't sure I was going to see published. Many of you know I've had a long-term fight with cancer over five years, this was my last uh, chance. My doctors had put me through every type of treatment. And basically, I wrote this book very quite unsure if I was going to see it on the other side. And so it is very nice to be here with you. It is nice to have received this, to be standing with this book, because it means a lot to me. I hope it will mean a lot to you. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Talk about your hard acts to follow. Um, uh, my name is Mark Connert, and uh, for my transgressions, I am the head of the history department here at the University of Calgary, and I would like to welcome you all uh, on behalf of my colleagues in the Department of History. Uh, first of all, I would like to ca congratulate uh, David Berkison and the Center and the staff for putting together what is, a, by all accounts, a very successful and enlightening conference. Um, but I'm really here today to introduce our next speaker, who is Krista Cook. Uh, she is assistant historian at the uh, Canadian War Museum, where she supports the development of special exhibitions. She has a BA from Mount Allison University, an MA in history from the University of Western Ontario. She also holds a certificate in museum practice from the Association for Manitoba Museums and is a co-founder of the Canadian Association for Women's Public History. She is here today in her capacity as assistant historian at the War Museum to talk about the new special exhibition, uh, Vimy Beyond the Battle, which has recently opened. So Krista, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, Perfect. Thank you. Um, first, uh, two things, um, three things really, I guess. Very hard to follow Tim, um, so I appreciate your patience. Um, Tim and I work together at the War Museum, but we are not brother, sister, husband, wife, uh, cousins, any of those things. 
Um, we are just lucky enough to share a last name, and I hope some of his reflected glory will rub off on me. <laughs> Um, Before I begin, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the organizers of the conference, uh, which I found to be very informative and friendly. I'm not a Vimy scholar, um, and I consider myself a social historian rather than a military historian, as well um, a public historian since 1999. I appreciate being included in this 360-degree discussion of Vimy. I found it to be very interesting. Today I'd like to share with you, uh, who won't be able to get to Ottawa, the Canadian War Museum's current special exhibition, Vimy Beyond the Battle. To mark the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Vimy Ridge, the Canadian War Museum has developed a suite of exhibitions and programs to help visitors better understand this iconic battle and how it has been remembered. Oops, sorry. In addition to hosting several musical events, public lectures by prominent historians, special Vimy-themed tours, the launch of a new Canadian Vimy coin and stamp, which you'll see circulating soon, free admission to the museum on April 9th, and my own personal favorite, an appearance at the gallery opening by Ottawa's very own Vimy Brewing Company. The Canadian War Museum team has put together five different exhibitions to mark the centenary. First, a redesign of our permanent First World War galleries The Vimy section, um, which is Tim's exhibition, that includes new artifacts, additional stories, and new AV and interactives. Um, That is basically a a look at the battle. Second, a two-dimensional traveling exhibition that is booked to travel to several Canadian and international venues. Third, a fine art show, Witness, which is on this spring at the Musée des Beaux-Arts in Arras. Fourth, Preserved in Stone, which is a small exhibition of um, replicated chalk carvings from the Vimy Tunnels, which is very interesting. Um, And it's currently on display in the lobby of the Canadian War Museum. And finally, Vimy Beyond the Battle, which is a 7,000 square foot special exhibition that sheds light on how and why we commemorate war. So this exhibition is more about commemoration and memory than it is about Vimy. And you'll see the heavy influence of many of the thinkers that we've heard from this weekend um, in the the exhibition concepts. Last week, the show opened, and it will run through November. Because the conference and the exhibition opening were so close together, I'm the one who will be representing the team today. Um, But there were other and more more, um, influential voices in the exhibition who would also have very much liked to have been here today. Um, Our team consisted of historian Melanie Morin-Pottier, creative developer Molly McCullough, project manager Patricia Grimshaw, and the Montreal design firm of Bondapod, and myself, a researcher. 100 years ago, Canadians fought a bloody battle at Vimy Ridge. No one is alive today with direct memory of the battle and very few of the war in which it was fought. But Canadians continue to remember and to commemorate Vimy. We erect memorials, we tell and retell stories, we treasure keepsakes and we participate in public and private rituals of remembrance. This exhibition sheds light on how and why we commemorate war by exploring private and collective memories of the Battle of Vimy Ridge of the First World War and of more recent conflicts. With over 100 artifacts and a wide range of media, the exhibition presents examples of individual, community and national Vimy-related commemorations. These historic examples are presented as a part of an interactive and participatory experience that encourages visitors to reflect on conflict commemoration in their own lives. In using new exhibition techniques, The War Museum hopes to position itself as an innovator in the presentation of Canadian history. As well, the exhibition hopes to attract new audiences who may normally think that the War Museum is not for them because of its content or method of presentation. This painting, The Flag, by John Liston Shaw, was chosen for the wall outside of Vimy beyond the battle because it embodies the exhibition's four main themes of grieving and healing, recognizing contribution, promoting a cause, and belonging. 
The messaging and themes of the exhibition grew out of our examination of a wide range of Vimy commemorations in the War Museum collections, from massive monuments to personal mementos to souvenirs from special events. In looking at this range of commemorations, we realized there were a number of questions that we wanted visitors to consider. They're here. The conclusions we reached are that commemorations ask individuals, communities, and nations to remember that they can be created by an individual or by a group, that they can be physical objects or events, that they can serve multiple purposes, and that many commemorations do more than one of these things, and that commemorations shape our collective memory and influence our present, which reflects back on many of the papers this morning. This led to our exhibition's main message, or in academic talk, talk our thesis, um, that commemorations, including those related to Vimy, are malleable, that they take different forms and serve multiple purposes over time. So we'll do a, a walkthrough of the exhibition. Um, in red are the audiovisual and multimedia experiences. In green are the um, interactive, sort of the activity centers, and in blue are the case displays. Vimy Beyond the Battle starts with a three-part introduction. The first part is fairly traditional, and the second two parts are multimedia experiences that set the visitor up for the rest of the exhibition. In the introduction, visitors will get some basic contextual information about the battle, but we let them know that this is primarily not a battle show. It's an exhibition that explores Vimy in terms of remembrance and commemoration. We've been fortunate enough to receive loans of a number of interesting artifacts. Here, Australian artist William Longstaff's The Ghosts of Vimy Ridge was loaned to us by the Speaker of the House of Commons of Canada. This painting depicts the memorial at Vimy Ridge, and I don't know if you can see them um, or not, but legions of ghostly war dead marching in the foreground. From the first room, visitors pass into the war tunnel, a multimedia installation that implies soldiers on the battlefield. Visitors passively contribute to this space. As they walk through the tunnel, their silhouettes are projected among the soldiers. Here you see the designer's conceptual drawings and the finished product. From the war tunnel, visitors come to the wall of commemorative lights. Um, this is Melanie Marais-Petit, the historian who is responsible for the show. This is a light installation where each light represents a soldier killed as a result of the Battle of Vimy Ridge. Visitors' presence affects the intensity of the lights. As more visitors gather in the space, more lights glow. This is meant to encourage visitors to consider the role they play in commemoration and remembrance. A nearby screen scrolls slowly through the nearly 3,600 names of the soldiers who died during the three days of the Battle of Vimy Ridge. Four days, four days. The main content of the exhibition is presented in four thematic sections that consider the different reasons why people commemorate. One commemoration can serve multiple purposes, and to highlight this point, we have placed at the center of the exhibition a model of the Vimy Memorial. Around it are text panels that explain the four different commemorative purposes, which are grieving and healing, recognizing contribution, promoting a cause, and belonging. In each section, we start with Vimy and the memorial and move outwards into other First World War and more recent commemorations. The first thematic section focuses on commemorations that help people to grieve and heal. Because the bodies of soldiers were not repatriated during the First World War, this section explores the rituals overseas and in Canada that helped families and friends to cope with loss. In this scrapbook photograph, you'll have to apologize for my photo as opposed to a professional one, um, Daisy Lawledge Evans points to the name of her brother on the Vimy Memorial. As was mentioned this morning, one of the purposes of the memorial is to act as a gravestone for the 11,285 soldiers who died in France with no known graves, and to reassure their family and friends that their loved ones would not be forgotten. In this section, we share letters that were sent to family members, written in a language to provide comfort to grieving family members, and which made the death of their loved one a sacrifice that was worth it. 
In this image, you can see the case where the Coleman letter from the previous slide is on display in the foreground with the commemorative lights in the background. Saying a proper goodbye was important enough to servicemen and women that they erected grave markers and performed funeral ceremonies under very difficult battlefield conditions. Wooden memorial crosses from the battlefield were later replaced by traditional stone markers by the Commonwealth Graves War, War Commission, War Graves Commission, pardon me. Few wooden crosses survive, which makes the ones that we have on display quite unique. This particular cross, um, made in the memory of Private John Ash, who was killed at Vimy, turned up in a descendant's garage in New Brunswick and was recently donated to the War Museum, and you can see it there on display. The next section is called Recognizing Contribution. Commemorations are used to recognize the roles individuals and communities have played in a conflict. In this section, we look at min military honors and awards as a means of recognizing individual contribution. This portrait by war artist Harold Knight shows Thane McDowell, a Canadian captain who received the Victoria Cross for his actions in the Battle of Vimy Ridge. The values embodied by recipients of the Victoria Cross were held in such high esteem that the Canadian War Memorials Fund commissioned war artists to paint portraits of each of the recipients. As well, we look at artistic expressions. Um, many of you may be familiar with this robe that was previously on display in Calgary. Um, the pictographs on Corporal Mike Mountain Horse's calfskin robe depict his First World War deeds, selected and arranged in order of their importance to him. Mountain Horse was a soldier from the Kainai Blood Reserve in Alberta. The robe was painted in the Blackfoot warrior tradition by Ambrose Two Chiefs and it is on loan to the Canadian War Museum from L'Esplanade Arts and Heritage Centre. Here's an example of a modern piece of art that recognizes the contributions of soldiers of the First World War. In this dramatic piece called Vimy Night Sky by Ottawa artist Sarah Hatton, each star was originally a brass fastener from the First World War CEF personnel files held by Library and Archives Canada. Um, as many of you know, those are currently being digitized. As the files were being digitized, the brass fasteners from the files were removed for conservation, and the artist kept the fasteners and used them to make this amazing commemorative artwork. The constellations are a representation of the sky over Vimy Ridge on the night of April 12, 1917. In the same section, visitors contribute to a work of art. This interactive installation includes fabric scraps upon which visitors can write messages of thanks or commemoration. It will grow in length as it is filled in and quilted by visitors, eventually growing to fill an entire wall of the exhibition. You can see in the small picture the brackets up the yellow wall that will eventually hold it as it grows taller and taller. When I left last week, it was already fully packed uh, about two feet deep, so it's growing already. The third section of the exhibition focuses on how commemorations help us to create a stronger sense of belonging. The 1936 to pil pilgrimage to Vimy is a perfect example of Canadians seeking a greater sense of community and belonging. Over 6,000 Canadians traveled to Europe for the unveiling of the Vimy Memorial, bringing veterans and family members together to share old experiences and to create new memories. In this section of the exhibition, we meet a selection of the 1936 pilgrims and their families and learn about their experiences. There's also an opportunity to watch film footage of the pilgrimage, showing museum visitors the Vimy Memorial's massive size and to experience the enormous crowds who travel to Vimy to remember their war dead. That's quite a moving video uh, compilation that they have um, gathered. Other items on display are poppies from the 2014 Tower of London poppy installation art, artwork that brought thousands of people together to collectively create a commemoration of the First World War. There you can see the sea of poppies that was created over several months in 2014. As well, we display examples of Canadian veterans tattoo art 
and wreaths, stories, and personal mementos left behind at Remembrance Day ceremonies at Ottawa's National War Memorial. Another important artifact in this section is the Highway of Heroes banner, which was displayed some 50 times along Highway 401 between Trenton and Toronto. Since 2002, many Canadians have lined this solemn route to pay their respects as the bodies of Canadian soldiers were transported home. The last section of the exhibition discusses how commemorations have frequently been used by people to promote causes that are important to them. In the, the foreground, you can see a, a ball cap, a birth of a nation, and the display is entitled Birth of a Nation, Birth of a Notion. We discuss the, um, the myth of Vimy as it has come about. Um, and we also discuss various individuals um, perceptions of Vimy and how they are used um, to further their own beliefs. Um, in the statue, um, the statue's strong upright middle finger, figure represents Canada passing the torch to the next generation, continuing to fight for the values that Allward believed were embodied in their sacrifice at Vimy. The figures as um, someone mentioned this morning, are called hope, faith, justice, charity, peace. So very Christian values. And in the background, you can see this poster, which was a representation of the Vimy Memorial that was used as a recruitment poster during the Second World War. That just shows how those, um, those values are perpetuated over time. In this section, we also uh, focused on how commemorations figure in community struggles for social justice and change. Here, Vimy veteran Sergeant Masui Mitsui protested against the forced relocation of Japanese Canadians during the Second World War by throwing his First World War medals, including a hard-won military medal, down in front of an internment official. After he returned from the First World War, Mitsui fought for the Japanese Canadians' right to vote, was displaced with his family during the Second World War, and was one of the last surviving Japanese Canadian veterans of the First World War. Following the relocation, he refused to wear these medals publicly again until the 1980s, choosing instead to mark Remembrance Day privately at home. The final multimedia experience in red at the bottom left of the drawing serves as a conclusion to the exhibition. This multimedia is made up of images of conflict commemorations from around the world through the 20th and 21st centuries. We wanted to bring the messages about historical examples of commemoration into a contemporary and international context. So whether or not you have a direct connection to the Battle of Vimy Ridge, the museum team is hoping that Canadians who visit the exhibition will recognize that the commemoration of the battle is all around us. In the naming of streets and bridges, the images on the $20 bill, and especially this year in many other places. It is our hope that, uh, that stories and experiences highlighted in Vimy Beyond the Battle will encourage visitors to reflect on what commemoration means to them, particularly in this year of celebration and remembrance. I hope you can come and visit. Thank you. These three panelists need no introduction, especially now after close to two days of discussion. Uh, and it's uh, my great honor to moderate a short discussion between them or among them. And I'm going to do that by asking them a couple of questions and we'll see where it goes from there. I'd actually like to ask Michael Epkenhans the first question. Michael, uh, you just came here a couple of days ago. You've been here many, many times. Um, but you, I assume, were not here through much of the last month, month and a half, where all of the uh, stories, news coverage, uh, media, et cetera, about Vimy Ridge really swept this country in a way that I haven't seen for many years, maybe since the 50th anniversary or at the end of the Second World War. 
And in, in my reading of the importance of the Battle of Vimy Ridge from a perspective of the war itself, uh, I've often thought that from the German side, this was not a very important battle, fought kind of in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and so how do you read what you're seeing around you as the commemoration, I, I mean, are you puzzled by what you're seeing here or, I'd really, really like to get your reactions and share it with us. Well, I'm not really puzzled. Looking back at all the commemor commemorative events in, past, in the past two th or three years, uh, we start to understand uh, how other nations uh, interpreted uh, events in a different way than we do. For us, it, it's not important because it was only one battle uh, somewhere in the middle of nowhere, as you said. But what we started to realize is the, 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 uh, the importance uh, these things had on other nations, uh, in becoming nations, as you, you said, as well as, of course, of realizing how hard uh, other armies tried to win the war. And that was it. And from this perspective, it has some kind of, um, for me, it's just one more stone in, 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 an, in an event to learn more about not only the, the, the history of the war itself, but also uh, of its aftermath, even a centenary ago, a century later. Thank you. Can I, can I ask? Uh, yeah, David, go ahead. Uh, I, I would love to know, sir, um, what does Germany mark in the First World War, and how does Germany talk about the First World War? Uh, maybe you could shed some light on that for us. Um, uh, I think it would, it would help us think about how Canada talks about the war. Oh, well, well this is, I don't know how much time we have, but... <laughs> 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 going to get you to the airport pretty soon. <laughs> well, the thing is, if we look at the, the, the centenary you know, three years ago, uh, and we had this uh, strange uh, event that first the Germans did not want to commemorate it. Because the Germans in, 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 in 2010, in 2011, 2012, when we said to the government and all other officials, there is a certain uh, moment in history we should not forget. And then the, all the officials said, well... The Allies will always come back with the war guilt question and all these things we don't want to talk about. So we better leave it as it is, and we wait and see, and, and then we better forget. And then came Chris Clark with his book, The Sleepwalkers, and this turned the whole thing uh, bottom up down. And then the Germans said, we went, they, they went in. And uh, it it's, was the beginning of a series of commemorative events of discussions and, uh, of course, of new historical writing on this event, uh, which had an important impact not only upon German history, but also on, on European and world history. And s ever since, we have somehow dealt with this event. But from, from our perspective, of course, the Battle of Verdun is much more important, or was much more important, uh, than, f for example, Vimeridge for you. And this is, this is the difference. And we have to wait and see what is going to happen next year. I, I really don't know at the moment what is going to happen. But it will not be the defeat itself, at least from my opinion, which will be important, but the question, what followed? What was the, the, the impact of the defeat upon German history, upon European history, and upon world history, upon the orders uh, the politicians wanted to establish where they were successful and where they were not successful. You talked about the Middle East uh, just a few hour, uh, moments ago. And this is one of the questions which uh, we have to deal with and we start to deal with, with the impact of the, 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 the failed, um, the failure to find solutions to problems uh, which somehow still, uh, we, we, we somehow still have to tackle with at the moment. Jack, have you got anything you want to add to that? No, I think I'll pass until you come to me. <laughs> All right, well then I'm going to ask you and Tim the next question. It's uh, pretty obvious, uh, we don't do history by uh, uh, arriving at a consensus, um, but 
it's fairly clear today from much of what's been written about Vimy Ridge and the Second World War, Canada, sorry, Canada and the First World War, over I'd say the last 10 years at least, that the Battle of Vimy Ridge in myth is quite different than the Battle of the Vimy Ridge that actually occurred. And I look forward to reading your book, Tim, which I just bought, and you kindly signed for me. Uh, a friend of mine keeps telling me that nations have pride and they have interests, which I completely agree with. If you look at the pride side, the mythology is very important. And I wonder what's wrong with playing up or at least acknowledging the fact that there is a lot of mythology about Vimy Ridge. Um, because it has come today. I mean, it's very interesting to me that a Francophone prime minister goes to the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Vimy Ridge and talks about the birth of a nation when we can probably count on the fingers of 10 hands the number of Francophones who are actually fought in that battle. And the fact that at home, the talk of conscription, the, the terrible crisis the country goes through in 1917, and which is still being echoed today in uh, Canadian international affairs and Canadian defense policy, and so on and so forth, the divide between Francophone and Anglophone Canadians, and yet we have a Francophone prime minister going and talking about the birth of a nation. So that's, he's talking about the myth, not the battle. Right. What's wrong with that? I'll, can I jump in, Chuck? Yeah. <clears throat> I, I do think the battle matters. And I think if you read my book, I, I, I do explore this. And um, I've written a lot about the battles of the First World War. And, you know, frankly, Vimy matters. It matters for the reasons Jack said. It matters to the Canadian Corps. It matters to the tactical evolution of war fighting. It's an important tactical victory. Yes, it doesn't end the war, but as Mike Nyberg tells us, no battle ends the war, right? And so Vimy matters for all kinds of reasons. The preparation before, as Mike Bechtold told us, the uh, air power and the use of intelligence, all of that matters. But of course, Vimy is more than a battle. And I guess the one thing I'll maybe throw back to the group to think about is how nations use battles or wars or rebellions to tell stories about themselves. Now think of the Americans with the American Revolution or Gettysburg. Those matter. They're crucial to the unfolding narrative of the Americans, the United States, how they see themselves. Think about how the Australians use Gallipoli to define themselves. It's very similar to what we say about Vimy. If you know the history of how Newfoundland used Beaumont Hamel, an absolute tragedy, it too was the birth of that nation for about a decade. And then other things come to change the meaning of that over time. So I don't think it should be any great surprise that Vimy is important to us that it means multiple things that change over time. I think all nations use war and conflict and rebellions to tell stories about themselves. I would be the first one to say that to understand our country, Vimy is not at the top of the list, right? It's healthcare, it's the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, it's some federalism, it's about how we negotiate multiple identities, it's all these things. But nonetheless, Vimy is a symbol that matters and I think we have to talk about that. And I think um, it goes beyond what happened during the war and how you use it over time and how you occasionally misuse it over time. And I think that by its very definition is, is how you talk about myth and how they unfold over time. And those are things that we should talk about with regards to Vimy. Regarding this, you are fully, I fully agree with you, but from the German perspective, there's only one battle which matters, which is the Battle of Sedong in 1870. <laughs> <laughs> it was, you know, it, just to be precise, it was the birth of a nation. Right. Yeah, that's, a, that's absolutely true, Michael. Jack? Um, David, you said pride and interests. Yeah. Uh, we talk about pride, and I think Vimy is a perfect example of how <coughs> Canadian pride is developed through a battle. What we never talk about is interests, national interests. Um, you could make a very good case that if Canada had been independent in 1914, it would have stayed out of the war, period. Uh, were our interests at stake in a German victory in Europe? Yeah, in trade to a certain extent. 
But were we threatened physically? No. You could make the same case in 1939. Were our interests at stake? Hitler was evil and a monster. Germany had to be stopped, but the Americans didn't think so. Were we a North American nation? Yes. Uh, were our interests threatened? Well, not so long as the Americans were there to protect us. We never talk about our interests. We went into World War I because as a colony, we had no choice. We were nominally somewhat more independent in 1939, but we went in because we were backing the British, period. Um, I think interests are something Canadians should look at much more than we do, and today as well. We don't think of interests very often. And I think that's something that uh, historians should be talking about in this country much more than they, do, than they have. Tim, Tim, what do you think about that? <laughs> I generally agree with everything Jack says. So. <laughs> um, I, I think these are important stories, and I think the great strength of this conference has been, as you've brought together multiple perspectives, and I think that's what we're doing here. And I hope, um, I hope that what we do as historians matters. I, I think um, how we look at the past, how we evaluate it, what sources we use, the stories we tell, all of these things should matter. And I know that, uh, and Jack and others have, um, have lamented the teaching of history in this country, um, and uh, the weakening of the bonds, I think, that come from that. But everywhere I go, and I think it'd be fair to say everyone in this room thinks that history matters, that what we did in the past matters. And I don't want to sound like a, re a recruitment poster for Canadian heritage, but I, I, I do think that these discussions are important to help us understand who we are. And uh, even if it is scratching at the Vimy idea, and finding that what is underneath it we don't like, perhaps collectively, that's an important act as well. Uh, I think it makes us better citizens, and I think it makes us a, have a better sense of who we are as a people. So um, I remain optimistic, probably because I've devoted most of my life to this, but I think it's important that we talk about and that we question, and I think uh, most of us would agree that it is fair game to talk and poke and prod Vimy as an idea, uh, and I think during that process we may have a better sense of, of other aspects of our past. Well, Tim, I'm going to give you the last word, and I'm going to close the conference by again thanking all of our sponsors, the Office of the President, the Office of the Provost, the Office of the Vice President of Research, the Department of History, the Department of Sociology, the University of Calgary Bookstore, the Institute or the Center for History and Social Sciences of the Bundeswehr. Thank you very, very much for participating from the very beginning, Michael, and uh, in fact, for helping us germinate th this idea. Uh, 41 Canadian Brigade Group, I don't know if EPO is still here, but thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, the bands last night certainly added to the dinner. Uh, Veterans Affairs Canada for your financial support and for uh, the support of the Minister, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, which was very generous to us. I also want to thank uh, from, the, from the CMSS, Shelley Wind, Donna Keen Ochowski, uh, Stephanie Reyes, and of course uh, Nancy Pearson Mackey, who did, I think we'll all agree, an outstanding job of putting all these pieces together. <clears throat> Nancy, where are you? And I want to thank our student volunteers, Harris Stevenson, Tim Choi, Caitlin Steva, Kiernan McClellan, Sam Hozak, and Ashley Morrison. And finally, thank you all for coming, for making this I think a great success, and I wish you all the best in your travels. And when Nancy does contact you uh, with a questionnaire, uh, please uh, fill it out so we can learn what we can do better the next time. Thank you very much. <laughs>